This is the chapter 11 of my book, 1970s America. The title of the chapter is Teaching at University of Florida. Sometime in December 1978, when I was in the final stages of my PhD, it was rumored that Dr. Farber was going to get a very big contract from USAID to set up a center to teach alternative, alternative energy technologies to scientists and engineers from developing countries. This center was subsequently named Training in Alternative Energy Technologies or TAET. A USAID team from Washington DC had visited our lab and the department and was shown all the facilities. I was specially invited to meet them and discuss with them about the interdisciplinary seminars that I had set up. Apparently the team had reservations about giving the center to UF since they felt that Dr. Farber would only stress the solar thermal aspects of alternative energy. Hence, they were told that I would be one of the main instructors in the program. And since I had set up these seminars, every aspect of renewable energy would be covered. In addition, being from India, I was supposed to have a developing country perspective, a very strange um, uh, thought process. These arguments and sales pitch by the university was probably bought by the team and we were informed sometime around June end of 1979 that we had a very strong possibility of getting the center. This was a two and a half million dollar project for five years and in those times was one of the biggest single project in mechanical engineering at University of Florida. During the Carter's presidency, USAID felt the need for setting up such a center in US which would give hands-on training in renewable energies to top energy planners and government officials of developing countries. Apparently, quite a few of the top universities like Cornell, Berkeley, etc. were in competition to get the center. Hence, it was a feather in cap, feather in Dr. Farber's cap to get it for University of Florida. So when the project was sanctioned in September 1979, Dr. Farber decided that I should be hired as one of the instructors in the center and hence I was taken on board. In a couple of months, two more instructors were hired and hence we had a full team of four instructors, including Dr. Farber and four of his staff. It was also decided to shift TAET to an off-campus facility called TRIO Center. TRIO, which was located almost 10 miles from the main UF campus, was a brand new swanky facility for holding workshops seminars and training courses. One of the instructors hired was Inky Leketek. Inky had worked in NASA and was taken as a lab instructor. He was an obese, weighing almost 325 pounds and loved to eat. We had a couple of hilarious incidents in restaurants. One day we went to a pizza hut in Gainesville for lunch. Inky ordered a thick crust, super medium sized pizza the waitress turned to me and asked me what I would like to drink. I told her that I have not yet even ordered. She was incredulous and said, you mean to say that he is going to eat all that pizza himself? We must have sampled some of the best restaurants, not only in Gainesville, but in all other cities, wherever we took TAT participants, courtesy Inky. Before visiting any city, he would get the magazines of that city and studied very thoroughly it's eating uh, places. He could eat a huge steak within minutes. In 1984, he visited us in Fulton. We had just moved into our new house and there were hardly any places in town for a good meal. So the poor guy had to survive for a week on a strict vegetarian diet in our house. All his pants became loose. He wanted to see Fulton. So I got him a bicycle since I did not have any car. He rode the bicycle all over the town. In those times, there was a circus playing in town. So according to Inky, there were many more people who came to see him ride a bicycle than to see the circus. Besides, when he came back, the bicycle was all bent out of shape because of his weight. While in Fulton, he tasted Alfonso mangoes and loved them. So when he went back to US, he took one dozen mangoes. Obviously, at a customs in New York airport, he was stopped and told to destroy them. 
So he calmly sat on the bench and ate all one dozen mangoes. He was a really jolly fellow and unfortunately died of cancer in 1998. Even before I joined, I was hired for TAET. I was doing some teaching and used to enjoy it. I was a graduate assistant to Dr. Farber. So anytime he went out of town, which he did quite regularly, I used to teach most of his classes. I guess students liked my teaching because at one time, they went to the chairman of the mechanical engineering department and requested him that I should teach a separate course on energy and especially related to biomimicry. The chairman told them, Anil is still a student, so how can he teach a separate course? Nevertheless, my occasional teaching must have made quite an impression on some of the students since even after 30 years, I got an email from one of the American students who after locating me, thanked me and wrote how, how my teaching helped and inspired him. Since I was put on the staff of UF, <clears throat> my visa status had to be changed from student, which was F1 visa, to either green card or H1 in those times. I was opposed to the idea of getting a green card since I thought that once I got, got it, I would never go back to India and thus I had a mental block against getting it. The UF administration was very surprised by my, by my decision. Normally people are ready to give an arm or a leg to get a green card and here I was refusing it when I had an opportunity to get it. But then I have always been a foolish and arrogant person. Hence the UF administration did the necessary paperwork for H1 visa rather than the green card. After that they arranged for my interview with the immigration official in Jacksonville to convert my student F1 visa to H1. I was also warned that the immigration officer at Jacksonville was a very obnoxious and rude person. So on the appointed day, I took a bus from Gainesville and reached the immigration officer immigration office for the afternoon interview. As per his reputation, the immigration officer, <clears throat> one Mr. Carlyle, was extremely rude when he started the interview with a nasty remark that UF must have already started the process of getting a green card for me, so applying for H1 visa was just a ruse. I immediately told him, Mr. Carlyle, I have no desire to stay in this beautiful country of yours and before we start this interview, I would like to inform you of a couple of things. Firstly, my wife was a US citizen and she renounced it. If she does decide to take her citizenship back, I will automatically become a US resident. Secondly, I will be working in a USAID sponsored project and I've been told that if I need a green card, then Washington will help me in getting it. And thirdly, if I wanted a green card in the first place, then the university would have applied for it rather than for H1 visa. So now you can ask me all the questions you want. He was quite taken aback by my remarks since in such circumstances, the applicants are generally very polite, subservient, and try to keep the immigration officer in good humor. Mr. Carlyle told me that in his long civil service, he had not come across a person like me and for the next 45 minutes, we had a very pleasant discussion on UF football. The next day, the UF officials asked me what I had done to charm that character. Apparently, they had contacted him and he spoke in glowing terms about me. I was immediately given an H1 visa just before I finally left for India in 1981. I again called Mr. Carlyle and informed him about my exact date of departure to India. He was quite apologetic about the interview exchange and said that the US would be better off by having people like me stay here. Before the TAT project, which started officially in September 1979, I was hired as a postdoc in the department. Thus, four to five months from the time of my PhD defense, to the start of my TAT assignment were hectic months with traveling, setting up solar house in UF and starting the dew condensation experiment. So in summer, break of 1979, I took my father-in-law who was visiting us to Fort Collins, Colorado for a conference. We drove from Gainesville all the way to Denver and back in almost 10 days. On one of the days, I drove nearly 1000 miles. Driving in US was a very pleasurable experience and with very low gasoline prices, it was also very economic. One could hire a medium-sized car with unlimited mileage for $30 per day in those days. During this trip, I also visited Solar Energy, Energy Research Institute also, or called SERI as it was called in those days. The name was later changed to National 
Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL. And nowadays, one has to get a special permission to visit the lab. In those days, it was a very easy to visit most of the national labs and discuss with various scientists about their energy projects. There were hardly any restrictions, which unfortunately came during the Reagan era. I visited the Thermal Sciences section of SERI, and since the lab had just started in late 1977, <clears throat> they were also scouting for staff. Thus, the concerned scientists took me to the deputy director of the lab. We chatted for quite some time, and suddenly he offered me a job at SERI. In that short time, somehow he got a liking for me and even showed me my parking space in the parking lot. I politely declined the offer, telling him that I was going to teach in the newly formed TAT Center at UF and then go back to India in a couple of years. The SERI deputy director was sorry to hear about my plans and told me that a research position at SERI was any day better than teaching at TAT. If any time you feel suffocated at UF, call me and we will take you in SERI, he said. In fact, during that trip, I was also offered a teaching position at the Colorado State University in Fort Collins to work with Dr. Loff, another solar energy pioneer. Getting my PhD under Dr. Farber was also a plus point in all these job offers. The best part was that they came without my asking. In fact, just after I had finished my PhD, I was also offered a good position in the world famous Bell Labs, since one of the senior managers at the labs had some time back done his PhD in, in mechanical engineering from University of Florida. In those days, getting a job after PhD in renewable energy area was quite easy, and I am sure I could have gotten a good teaching position in any university if I had chosen to do so. However, I was quite certain of going back to India and felt the TAT experience of teaching scientists and engineers from developing countries will be the best postdoc for me. Since we were getting the TAT center, we decided to consolidate it at one place all the solar energy equipment and projects that were scattered all over UF campus. It was also felt that with this big grant, the solar energy work at UF will expand further and hence we decided to set up a solar energy park. A 23 acres facility was provided by UF just off the campus to house it. Consequently, I and one of my one of the graduate students in our solar group were given this task of setting up a solar house and the equipment in this park. Thus, we set up a solar house which was heated and cooled by solar energy and also laid a fairly large size concrete slab to display other solar energy equipment. The solar house was originally set up by Dr. Farber in Gainesville in early 1970s and was the first house in the US to be completely air conditioned by solar energy. It was located in a part of Gainesville, close to a major road, and when the road was converted to a four-lane highway, the house was shifted to energy park. Because of its importance, it was declared a national landmark building in 2003 by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME. So both of us laid 50 feet by 30 feet concrete slab for displaying the solar equipment. Besides, we set up the solar collectors on the roof of the solar house, welded all the pipes and did all the plumbing for solar heating and cooling. This exercise took nearly two months. I learned a great deal about using earth moving equipment for laying the concrete, welding co copper tubing welded about 1500 joints and general hardware of plumbing and solar systems. This hands-on experience was a tradition in our lab, one of the main reasons for my coming to UF. Unfortunately, this type of training is getting scarcer and scarcer nowadays and most of the students, graduate students, simply graduate without dirtying their hands. In fact, all my PhD experiments were designed and fabricated by me and other graduate students in our lab used to do the same for their own experiments. This practical training not only helped me to teach the TAT participants about hardware but also helped me in setting up my lab when I came, came back to Fulton in Maharashtra. It was as if I was being prepared to return to rural India. During this time, a funny incident had took place. A three-member high-powered Chinese delegation came to see our solar energy lab. Most of the time when foreign delegations came to visit our lab, Dr. Farber used to ask me to show them around. Since our lab was world famous, lots of foreign delegations came and I was always glad when asked to take them around. 
uh, take them around. Dr. Farber somehow never felt happy in meeting the Asian delegations. The head of the Chinese delegation was one Mr. Wu, who was also a Politburo member of the Chinese Communist Party. He spoke good English and told me that he did his master's in mechanical engineering from Caltech or California Institute of Technology in 1949. The other two solar energy researchers feigned not to know any English, though in a slip of later on, they were also observed to speak good English. In fact, I found all of them quite devious. The day they arrived at our lab was the same day when the United States and China established embassies in their respective capitals and so there was quite a lot of photo op on the campus. Initially, Mr. Wu was quite reserved since he did not expect an Indian to show him around, but very soon he warmed up to me and when I told him about my father's very indirect connection with Mao and Zhao Enlai. One of the persons in jail with my father during 1942 freedom struggle was Dr. Madan Atal. He was uncle of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first Prime Minister. Dr. Atal became very fond of my father and he, as he was an excellent cook, he also taught my father to cook some well-known Kashmiri dishes. During Mao's long march in 1930s, Dr. Atal had visited China and had given medical treatment to both Mao and Chao Enlai when they were critically ill for which they became eternally grateful to him. He therefore became their very close personal friend. I was told that there was a bust of Dr. Atal in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. I still remember that in early 1960s, when the relations between, relationship between India and China deteriorated as a last resort, Prime Minister Nehru sent Dr. Atal to plead with Mao and Zhao Enlai. Dr. Atal was treated very well by both of them but they were unmoved. In fact, when he came back to Lucknow after this trip, he gave my father a small packet of green tea that Mao had given him as a present. As Mr. Wu became friendlier towards me, he started telling me how Chinese remain backward in technology because of the Gang of Four, alluding to the four leaders, including Mao's wife, who had plotted against Deng Xiaoping. This reference to Gang of Four became a constant refrain of Mr. Wu's during the day. I tried telling him that he was nearly 10,000 miles away from China and so did not have to parrot the official line about Gang of Four. But I guess the remnants of the communist rule were still very much in existence and so everybody in the delegation was spying on each other. What also surprised me most was that though Mr. Wu was a Politburo member and hence must have been close to Mao and Chinese leadership, he had suddenly changed his colors after the change of guard and was spouting the new party mantra of economic liberalization of Mr. Deng. As I was showing them around <clears throat> our lab, I saw from the corner of my lab, of my eye, that one of them was pocketing a small piece of insulation used in solar collectors. So I took a one square foot panel of the insulation and gave it to them, telling them that it was a present from the University of Florida Solar Energy Lab. All of them became extremely red in face and numbled an apology. That is when, I, the, when the other two also spoke excellent English. <clears throat> I again saw Mr. Wu during the International Solar Energy Society conference in Atlanta in June 1979. By this time, Americans were following all over themselves to curry favors from the Chinese, since China was a flavor of the month. So there was a special session in ISIS to hear Mr. Wu, who was to give a talk on the Chinese efforts in solar energy research. He read his speech and refused to answer any questions, citing difficulty in spoken English. I knew very well that he spoke excellent English and was capable of answering any question. After his talk was a lunch break and since so many people were crowding around him, I decided to see him later on. After an hour, I suddenly saw him, the Politburo member of the Communist Party of China carrying in one hand a McDonald's hamburger and another a can of coke, the two ultimate symbols of capitalist society. What an irony and what a sight it was. This irony was not lost on Mr. Wu either because when I wanted to photograph him, he became extremely red in face and vehemently opposed to it. I wondered what Mao must have been thinking in his grave about his loyal cadre member. From September 1979 to January 1980, we had to develop the course material for T80 
and also set up the lab and experiments. The onus of doing all this mostly fell on me, partly because a substantial part of TAT program was based upon on the imparting instructions by external lectures, lecturers, a majority of whom I already knew and when invited they came readily. Quite a few of these lecturers were distinguished UF professors that I used to invite for the multidisciplinary seminars. Besides, was also, I was also in tune with Dr. Farber's philosophy and hence knew what teaching material to develop. Aside from writing the course program and timetable, I used to also spend 8 to 10 hours per day on the phone ordering equipment for our lab and discussing with requesting and cajoling energy experts from all over US to come and lecture to our participants. It was not very difficult in those times to get those experts to come and lecture since I knew most of them and also the fact that our solar energy program was very well known. Also we gave them to and fro airfare plus an honorarium of $200 per lecture and an overnight hotel accommodation. Thus we were able to get some of the world's renowned experts to lecture in TAT program and these lecture seminars an extension of my department's multidisciplinary seminars were always rated as the most popular aspect of our course.